Hi everyone, my name is Nick and I'm here at the Fitzwilliam Museum uh, to show you a very special exhibition. And uh, we're behind the scenes, you actually can't get into this exhibition yet and you're only be, you're going to be able to get into this exhibition for one day, this Saturday. So this really is very exclusive indeed. Um, I'm very lucky as well because I've got two of the experts from the museum with me. Uh, I've got Helen and Julie here. So uh, Helen is a curator at the museum and uh, Julie looks after the, uh, the conservation at the museum and they're going to be uh, telling me um, about this, well, this amazing scroll uh, that we're going to look at at the moment. Uh, keep watching if you like ancient Egypt. If you like kind of, I guess, sort of interesting things to do with death that are a little bit grisly, uh, and if that's kind of fair, isn't it? Anything sort of a, a bit mysterious, uh, keep watching basically. This is going to be very interesting indeed. Um, before we have a look at it, well, I guess I feel I should tell everyone at home uh, why it's so dark here. So, why, why is it so dark? That's such really dark. Well, <clears throat> it's, uh, the dark is very light sensitive. It's mostly to do with some of the pigments, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, that, that, that are on it. And it's been um, amazingly well protected ever since it came from Egypt, most of it, which is in 1922. Right. Most of it was kept in the dark in the basement of the Fitzwilliam Museum. So um, it, as, as the pigments, as the paintings are in such brilliant condition, and they're such special paintings, we, we need to keep them that way. So we only bring it out for special occasions, although it's, you know, it's always available, of course, if people yeah. want to come and see it, we make it available. But this is, this is something we can't do very often, is have the whole thing out. Wow, so this is very special indeed. Um, remember, uh, we really want you to like and to share this because we want as many people as possible to watch this video. So please do like and share and tag anyone in it. And have uh, we got any comments and questions already, Richard? We have, yes. So Nigel is struggling. Uh, they said it's very dramatic and dark. Also, more volume needed, so it might be worth just keeping your voices up. Okay. Oh, okay. No, we're, we're, very, we're in a very cavernous room as well, aren't we? Okay, so we'll up the volume too. Yeah. I'll tell you what, should we have a look at yeah. it? Hello. Come I'll on, tell you about this. this. It's the Book of the Dead, by the way. That's what we're looking at. But what is, what, what is that? What well, is the I Book of the Dead? Say, do you know what the Book of the Dead is? Well, I know it from, I'm trying to think, so... Uh, well, there's the, like the film The Mummy. The Mummy. Uh, as, uh, uh, I sort of vaguely remember it from that. Yeah. But that, that is about it. And I, it's, I presume it's, it's similar. It's, massive, it's, similar. Yeah, it's massively inaccurate. Right, really, okay. The mummy. So let me use that as a source of reference right. on Egyptology. But um, it gives you a sense of um, the mystique of it because for a lot of people it's a very interesting document. But actually, what its purpose was was to get you from this life into the afterlife successfully and that was quite a difficult thing because the Egyptians thought there were all sorts of um, hurdles in your way, difficult things you had to manage like waterways you had to cross and in order to get a boat to cross the waterway you had to name all the different parts of it so handily in this papyrus scroll there's a list of all the different names of the bits that you need and there's all sorts of other things that, that you see on here. Right. Um, so, so just to be clear, someone, if, if someone died, yeah. uh, this would be um, sort of uh, left with them so that they could then pass through the, the, the underworld, right? or pass to, through the, pass to the underworld, is that yeah, right? Yeah, it helped them to go from this life to the other life. Right. And you'll see in it, there are lots of illustrations showing the dead person whose name was Ramose moving yeah, there's a really good one here actually. I like this one particularly. Um, because we call it the Book of the Dead, mm -hmm. but the ancient Egyptians didn't use that name. It's a quite dramatic name. They called it a book of going forth by day. And that's exactly what we're seeing going on here. This is Ramose here, and as I said, you see him moving down the scroll mm -hmm. in that direction. This is him going out of his tomb, which is shown here. This is the tomb set into the hillside, oh, wow. and that's the, what the, is being illustrated there. And this spell in particular is called the spell for going forth by day, and that's what that says here, the spell of going out in the day, words spoken by, and then it gives the name of this chap here. So it's slightly damaged here, but we can see that it's something to do with his uh, supervisor of documents, scribes of the Lord of Two Lands, and the Lord of Two Lands was the king of Egypt. 
-hmm. And then his name is written here, Ramose. So Ramose is a, a scribe. Yeah. Is, is there anything else we can learn about him from, from, well, from this? Well, I think one of the things that's very noticeable about this is the quality of the decoration on here. And I, I'm sure we'll talk a lot about that because it's one of the big features of this. But also, it's really well written, it's really clearly written, and what, just you know, reading down those hieroglyphs is very easy because the scribe was very skillful. And also, um, it's, there's no gap left for the name to be inserted. So this isn't one that was written in advance and then you just inserted your name. This was one that was written purpose-made for a mosaic. And it's a larger format than right. your average scroll. So this is, this is the ex complete extent of it. And we're talking about sort of 40, 41 centimetres from top to bottom. Whereas normally they're about 35 centimetres. So it's sort of normally about that sort of size. So this is a whole scale of magnitude bigger. So much more expensive because papyrus was an expensive material. Right. So, so this is a wealthy and important yeah. guy. And can, I guess, Ina, can we just do a sort of long shot that shows you the sheer length of yeah. this scroll as well, because it is, it's really long too. Would they usually have been this long? Is that fairly normal? Um, they were lengthy documents. I mean, yeah. there's some that you do get ones that are quite short. Um, you get extracts of them, but there are quite a few examples that are lengthy like this. Mm -hmm. um, and the full extent of this we reckon is about 20 metres. There are gaps, we've left gaps in between things because there we have numerous fragments that we can't place. Um, but th they are, um, it's clear, it's about sort of 20 metres long. Yeah. yeah. Can so we have like, a look at another spell? I'd be interested to see an example of the, the sort of spell that uh, yeah. they would have to use. It's well, I was going to find the one with the, um, the, the boat, actually. Oh, which, uh, great. I'm going to hunt for that. Okay. <laughs> it's further down here. I'm sorry, we're dragging me along. <laughs> uh, oh, I lost it. That's all right. Well, let's stop here, actually. Okay. This, is, this is a really interesting spell. Ah. Now, you have to imagine here, in this little gap here, that there would be a judgment scene. This would be the very famous weighing of the heart scene. And we have fragments of that, but we can't put them together to make a coherent picture. But here, we've got Osiris, very fragmentary, but we managed to put them together, overseeing what would be going over there. And he's got a gold face here. And actually, this is really interesting. I think, do you want to say something about that, Julie? That's yeah, really amazing. Well, um, gold is quite unusual. I mean, again, it's about you know, mm -hmm. showing sort of the status of this, this document, but also the way that gold has been used on this document is very interesting because we, we see it in different ways here. It's a very, very, I mean, this is gold leaf. It's incredibly thin. Wow. And you can actually see the texture of the papyrus um, through through there. We'll talk, we can talk about papyrus a bit in a minute, but you can actually see the structure of the, of the papyrus underneath. But in other places, um, we've got gold that's been used more to create texture, to sort oh, of, it's right. been sort of crumpled up. Yeah. Um, about none of the pieces, I don't think any of them are, uh, that are on, actually fit into the document that we can put together actually show that, but we have some examples of that we, we might have on Saturday, where the gold, it's almost like somebody's crumpled up a piece of, you know, a, a, a silver wrapper around a, t a sweet or something, yes. and pushed it down. And wow. then we look at a cross section of that gold under the microscope, we can see all the little different layers. Mm. So it's a very subtle, way of yeah. the material. So, so, so yeah. you might have some of this on, uh, some of that uh, to show on Saturday. Possibly, yes. So, so, so remember, if you want to see uh, this in person, then uh, to, to come here on Saturday, it's, it's basically your only opportunity to, to do it. So, uh, so, so, so make sure you do. And, and please do uh, like and share this in, in the meantime, so as many people as possible can, can see this video. And do ask a, ask a question and I'll, I'll put them to our experts. So, oh, did you want to tell me more yeah, about this? I was going to tell you more about this yeah. spell. So we've got Osiris watching the judgment going on there, and then the next thing to happen was that the dead person had to go through a process of saying a whole load of things that they had not done. And so this is known as the negative confession. And that's what we've got written here. So what happens is that in each segment there's a, a column saying the name of the god that the person is addressing a little picture of the god and then what they didn't do so in a more <laughs> sort of complete section you can see that here yeah. so here this is oh somebody or other and then the little picture of the god here is actually turning the other way and then i didn't do something or other here now what this shows us here is that first of all 
we know that the, the, when the priors were sort of rolled out in this section here, the person laying out the text here drew the framework with all the lines in it mm. before anything else happened. Then the scribe wrote in red, O oh, somebody, all the way along here, with using the red pen all the way down here, and then went down here and wrote not, 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 <laughs> not, 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 all the way across there, and then back to the top row, wrote the names of the different gods here, all the way down here, all the way down to the end, and then wrote down here the things that you didn't oh, do. Right. But he kept jumping columns, so these don't match up in the way that they're meant to do. So every now and then there's an inserted column because we want to get back to the right order. Oh. So um, it, it gives us a very clear impression of how that was done. Now, the thing we don't know is whether then these illustrations were added or whether they were done first. That's something we can't tell. Oh. And it's very clear about the, the way it was written. Fascinating. And, and these, um, these, these things that... Uh, He's saying he hasn't done. Yeah. Were they kind of standardised across yes. these sort of documents, Absolutely. or were they specific things? For this? So, so these were sort of standardised yeah. things that you there always said. There was a standardised text that you yeah. that you followed to do this, and uh, which is why we know that, that this chap wrote it in that way. Wow. Yeah. Fantastic. But what we also don't know, but we we can surmise, is how many scribes were involved, how many artists were involved. Mm -hmm. The artist who did, how to say all of the vignettes, all the artists, if there was more than one, were fantastically skillful. Um, the, the amount of paint, I think I'm right in saying this, Julie, is that right? The amount of paint is very small mm. to create the effects. Yeah, yeah and very, yeah. 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 I mean, it, it's just extraordinary. And, and, and I mean, you, I, you can say something about the use of pigments a bit. Well, well let's go on to the pigments in, yeah. in a moment. Yeah. Uh, before we do, I just mm. got one more question, which is, so, so would this have been created in advance of his death, or would he have died and they thought, right now, OK, we've got to create this for him? Or is it difficult to say? I, I think, think it's difficult to say. Yeah. I mean, what, what we can we can say for sure that this was made specifically for him. Whether he chose to have it made for him or whether his family, so the quality of it is so high that it's quite conceivable it was done by somebody within his workshop. He maybe had access to really good scribes, really good materials, because it is so beautifully done. Fantastic. Well, shall we have a look at the, the paints? Because you've got some of the pigments here, yeah. haven't you? Yes, indeed. Uh, the, 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 well, I saw one earlier that had like a sort of skull and crossbones yeah. on it or something. <laughs> yes. uh, so are these safe? Are well, these OK? Yeah, well, the ones that are out are. Great. You have to be a little okay. bit careful. The thing is that um, they actually used, uh, we've, we've done analysis of all pigments mm -hmm. on this, and they're using a very small range of pigments to get some incredibly sort of, uh, an incredible range of quite subtle and changing effects. So if we look just at this section, which is why we've come to this one, you can see on here that we've got um, an incredible range of yellows, browns, yeah. reds, and so on. But in fact, they're only working with, um, these are um, iron ochres. This is a, a these, these are all these, most of these um, are not that one or that one, but most of these are natural minerals. So right. they're just from the rocks around. So we've got limestone, for the making the white, the calcite. We've got something called um, huntite, which is um, a, a sort of like a limestone that also has magnesium in it and is a very um, bright white. It's, I always like to think of it as a sort of, you know, the, the gloss paint, the white gloss paint so of the that Egyptian be, world. So would that be that there? That's, or, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the huntite. And then we've got the iron oxides, um, yellow ochre, you can see there, and red ochre. Um, it's just a slightly different mm -hmm. form. So those are the, sort of the principal yellows and, um, and reds. But we've also got the two poison guys here, <laughs> which I can't take out. Now, if you can shine a, a light, if we've got a light or two on that, you'll see that this sparkles like crazy. And this oh, yes. is all piment. And all piment is, how about that? Can you see that now? You see that? And it's, that's to do with the structure of the mineral. Mm -hmm. But, and it's this lovely bright lemon yellow. You can see it, it's very much, it's very different to the yellow yeah. ochre. And, um, and it's got a close relative, which is called Realgar, that's which nice. is this that's one. Right. Yeah, that's nice. So we've oh, got, great. there they oh, are. Oh yes, you can see the shine. Yeah, and yeah. that's sort of more orange, but they're both arsenic sulfides. 
so they're very poisonous. Right, okay. Okay, and you know, we, we well, I don't know, um, being a scribe, probably grinding these pigments up, or whoever was doing the grinding, and working with them, always... It's probably what probably, led to his death, wasn't probably it? Short, <laughs> probably shortened your life, yeah, eventually, oh, right. yeah. Wow, and, the, so, and, and these were used on this, so can you point yes. out some of the different um, okay. colours so, involved? Talk us um, through. Well, uh, there's just two more to tell you oh, about. Oh yes, sorry. And um, we've got black, and the black is either lamp black, so soot, or this oh. board I've got here, which is charcoal, so it's burnt oh. wood. So we've got both of those on here. And then we've also got this one, which you see here. Now this is Egyptian blue. And the Egyptians are sort of always credited with make, having made the first synthetic manufactured pigments. Oh, right. And this is it, this is Egyptian blue. Now this is some, we've been doing experiments making Egyptian blue. So this is some that actually has been made um, for, for our experiments, mm -hmm. although we do have ancient examples. And it's, you can get blue and green, and we can see some green, oh, well, you, get, you can see here some turquoise, um, and somewhere around, not immediately here, but we'll, we will see some, there is uh, green as well. And how this is made, it's made by using um, copper rocks, uh, copper-based rocks, or, mm -hmm. or copper indeed, and um, that was fired in a crucible with um, some limestone, some sand, and some salts from the Nile, because you needed that mouth like. It's like making glass. Oh. So this is like a sort of glassy material, which then has to be ground up and refired. Oh, and it wow. makes this fantastic pigment yeah. known as Egyptian blue, or indeed Egyptian green. And which one you get depends on the, 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 the different quantities of copper minerals in there and the type of fi and the firing temperature and conditions that, that it was made oh, under. Amazing. And would, these colors, so, would, would this colour in particular have been quite expensive then, or did these sort of scrolls tend um, to make use of these colours? Well, Egyptian blue, I mean, there's a, well, hmm, is it, yeah, Egyptian blue, there's a, a lot of Egyptian, okay. you can find Egyptian blue everywhere. Right, okay. Um, Orpiment and Rialgar, yes, a little bit more so, probably, mm -hmm. actually. Um, the, um, so, yeah, I'm, what we're seeing on here is, so the bands along the top, um, we know that, um, in fact, there is orpiment in this, so you probably can't see it in this light, but we've got orpiment and then we've got the red, the red ochre in those. But a lot of these colours are made up of um, either um, orpiment, that's, you see, that's the very bright, pale, that's the very yeah. pale orpiment. Here we've got um, uh, Rialgar painted over orpiment, so to get it, so to get a quite a different effect. I mean, they were using lots of layering, and they're also using, um, uh, th th they're using combinations as well. So Ramose's skin is always a mixture of Rialgar and uh, calcite. Mm. If we just go down here and yes. look at Mrs. Ramose. Oh, great. Here she is. And you can't, you have to get very close. And in fact, that's the thing. This is, again, this is the reason why people need to come and see this because the detail in these illustrations yeah. is amazing. You really need to get close to them. But you can see that she's got this beautiful white robe, and that's painted in that, that gloss white, the huntite, with a very thin wash of huntite. But her skin is actually made of calcite, which is that slightly warmer, the limestone one. But mixed in with it, we can see under the microscope, there are tiny little bits of um, the carbon, the Egyptian blue, some of the yellows. And it's just to make that slightly different oh, wow. yeah, shade of white. Of so her, her, you know, her robe is this really brilliant white, yeah. but her skin is slightly sort of warmer yeah. colour. Fantastic. So, so, so remember, if you want to get up close to this, then you're going to have to come here on Saturday. So uh, make sure you do that. And I believe that you're letting people in in sort of relatively small groups, aren't you? So that people yeah, can yeah. properly have a, have a look at it without loads of crowds yeah. and, and, and ask, ask the experts. Yeah, when they come to the museum, they get a ticket with a time on it. Right. And that's the time to come up here. So, so if, what's the advice? Get here early? What do you think? Mm, I, well, I would think probably. Get, get here early, there you go. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, it is fantastic, uh, fascinating stuff. Um, I, what I want to know a bit more about is, um, well, I guess, how did this get to here? How did it get to the museum? Well, it, it was found at a site called Sedment, which right. is um, 
It's about 70 miles south of Cairo. And uh, Petrie, who's quite a well-known archaeologist, was excavating there. And uh, inside one of the tombs, he found a number of objects belonging to a man called Ram, Ram Mose. Um, and then he found this papyrus in fragments. And what's fascinating is his document, the way he's recording it, he says that this is the, the, the finest quality of, of drawing that he'd seen. Oh, and, right. you know, he'd seen an awful lot. And, and whereabouts was this? This was in 1921. Right. And it came to us the following year in 1922. And, uh, you know, we can take what he says quite seriously because he knew what he was talking about, really. And, and you know, now we see it laid out, you really do see the fine yeah. quality of their workmanship. It's and, amazing. And actually, we should just go look at the birds. So that you yeah. Just say, actually, can we stop at the donkey? On the oh, yeah, that's right, right. okay, so we're going to look at a bird and we're going to look at a donkey. Uh, remember, if you've got any um, questions, then uh, do put them in the comments below. And uh, so, we'll just, so this is a donkey, Yeah, so this is one that was right. found in loads of fragments and we had to put mm. together. This is a spell, I think it's called the spell for him who repels an ass. Uh, or what's it? S Ma the repelling the the one who swallowed an ass. That's right. Right. And so we can see here the donkey itself. Here, these are all little fragments. And there, on the back of the donkey, is this snake, sinuous snake there, and it's biting the back of this donkey's neck. And Ramose is saving the donkey here, so he's repelling the one who's, who swallows the ass. But what's so amazing about this is donkey, obviously, as you would be if you're being eaten by a, a snake, is looking a bit startled. Um, and you can actually see the muscles on its mm. face and there's a lot of sort of um, shading yeah. that you see on the back of the donkey and that is really unusual. You, I mean, it, Egyptian art is not normally like that. So this is, as I say, a, an artist of immense skill who yeah. did this and it's incredibly unusual. So again, this is something to come and really look at because That's I don't see it very often. So, so just to, to be clear, so this, is this one of his tests? Yeah, that you're, That's so one of the things this is telling him how to... Get, get past this, this test. Basically. Yes, I mean, and also, um, you have to remember Egyptian magic was such that because he has a document that has the words in it, he doesn't actually have to worry about it because it's all happening automatically. Oh, I see. Because the word is magical in its own, own right. So, in a way, you have to avo it allowed him to avoid having to say all these things because he got the document. He just kind of go, oh, I've got what's here. So it's sort of like a pass, yeah, really. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, excellent. And so we've, we've looked at the donkey. Yeah. What was the other thing yeah. you wanted to show? Birds. Birds. Right, okay, let's do that. And you're getting a very quick sneak peek of everything else, yeah. but as I say, you're going to have to come here if you want to see everything. Yeah. Oh, wow. So, so these, are the these, are, these are what we call transformation spells, where um, this enables a person to tran be transformed into the right mm -hmm. kinds of things at the right moment. And this is where the spell for transforming into a hawk and the detail, little individual dots on the feathers that sort of give you a real texture to it. And honestly, trust me, these, all these details that you see painted on here are really fine and not something you see on this sort of document. And the little claws of the bird <laughs> oh, yeah. go around the frame. <laughs> And so it's like he's sort of perching yeah. on there. It's just amazing. And did you say, did you say this was a transformation spell? Yeah. What's that Yeah. Then? Well, it's, it's, there are lots of spells where um, allowing the person to be transformed into different things. This is the trans hawk. Uh, here is being transformed into a crocodile. This is being transformed into what's called a son of the earth, mm -hmm. which is a snake. But why you would want to do that is somewhat lost on us. We, to be we don't know, but it was an important thing to do. It was a very important thing. And what you find is that you get it, within these papyrus scrolls, the transformation spells kind of come in a clump. Right. In part, it's usually sort of in the midsection of the papyrus. So we've got a whole bunch of these transformations here. There's a swallow here, but beautifully also, um, there's a heron here. Yeah, uh, this is totally gorgeous. This, I the mean, the detail again is amazing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and you really sort of feel the, the downiness mm -hmm. of the, the feathers on the bird. It's mm. amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Are there any other particularly interesting spells that it's worth uh, oh. quick? I mean, I know there's a lot, isn't there? there well, we, in fact, we looked at the back end uh, down there when oh, we were yeah. looking at the different pigments. Um, let's just go back to this one because uh, this is where they kind of get to the, the ultimate goal. Ah. So we've got Ramose and Mrs. Ramose here. Um, standing and saying, it, sort of reciting a hymn. And, and can I ask, sorry, would, would she have been, does that mean she'd have been dead already? Or what, what does not that necessarily, mean? Okay. not necessarily. It just shows that she's there with him 
for in this particular section. She appears in certain sections of the papyrus, but she doesn't appear throughout it, so it's not one that it involves her particularly. She just right. needs to be in the right places. So they're sort of saying a hymn, and there, here is the ultimate goal, which is the, what's known as the fields of reeds or the fields of yaru. And this is very fragmentary. I don't know if that's partly because of the blue or something, but it's also, I think, because it's towards the end of the scroll mm -hmm. where it was most tightly rolled up. Um, and we can see that the, these fields are set within waterways. These, these are waterways, these mm -hmm. bits here. And so they are sort of like little islands in this mm -hmm. area. And on there, obviously what you wanted to do was do agriculture, apparently, because here <laughs> we've got Ramose um, driving a plough, being pulled by um, some oxen here. Here he's using a huge hoe to hack up the ground. Here we see him and his wife reaping in the fields. And then there are some more, more mysterious things. Here's a, another one of these herons. And here are some mounds of grain here in this sort of yellow. And there are other sort of mysterious things going up here with various deities that he's propitiating and making, sort of oh, saying yeah. hello to here. So, so this was the life he was aiming for That's once he got was, through uh, yeah. everything else. And then the final thing that we have here is him and his wife um, reciting a hymn to probably to the sun god Ra, mm -hmm. um, who would be depicted at the end, but we don't have that last part, unfortunately. Mm, fascinating. And, and Julie, you were telling me that some of this had been on display before and some mm. of it hasn't. Is, is, that, is that right? Yes. Um, well, it's, it, yes, it came to us after um, Petri found, found mm -hmm. these thousands of fragments. It came in thousands of fragments, 65 folders of fragments. Wow. Now, some of it was put together in the 1920s, um, some of it by Petrie, some of it in Cambridge, and that was actually one of our conservation challenges because it had all been put together with, you know, bits of old sort of, you know, corners from things that you would stick stamps and stamp albums <laughs> with and sticky well, labels okay. and so on. Um, but the, um, but never really enough of it had been put together in a state where it could be displayed. So, so and, how do you get that? that yeah. Well, and so, but, we, but we, that was very, very lucky. That right. was really fortunate okay. because what I was talking about, and about the light and why this mm -hmm. is so dark and why we don't keep it in the light, is we can see um, beautifully with the two figures of Ramose here. This section was put together and it was put on display in the galleries in the 1960s and so it was there for it was out for many many years mm -hmm. in the light not in bright light but in the light for a long time and i think you can see so if you remember the um the sparkly the sparkly ornament and the realgar and these arsenic sulfides are what um he, his skin is painted with but here it looks rather pale and it's a bit sort of, um, it looks a little bit almost like sand. There's a mm. strange sparkle coming off it. And if you look at it on this figure at the end, which was kept in the dark for all that time, this is bright yellow. Yeah. And this is the effect of the light. It's deteriorated this arsenic sulfide pigment to an arsenic oxide pigment, in fact, on the surface. This is, and of course, it hasn't done the papyrus a lot of good either. Yeah. But this is, so this is why we need to protect it from the light because of the sensitivity, principally of these arsenic sulfide pigments that are on here, and they are all over it. Oh, I <laughs> see. Wow. Oh, so, so there you go. I don't know to what extent you could see that. I don't know how good the picture is for you to be able to see that. But there is a, a noticeable difference. And as I say, if you uh, want to really see that closely, see it properly, well, you're going to have to come here on Saturday. Um, so there we go, we've kind of worked our way all the way along, haven't we? We've seen some fascinating uh, things. Is, is there anything else in particular you want to show me before we uh, uh, finish this, this uh, video? Well, we talked about the glass jigsaw puzzle. We've got the glass jigsaw puzzle. Do you want to show the glass jigsaw puzzle to Let's do that very quickly. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Sorry to so, have you moving about all the time, Ina, but uh, yeah, and so this, this is, is what you mean by the, the right. This is the most complicated one, this one. Uh, this one. Uh, no. I think probably this one. Yes, sorry. I'm so sorry. This one here. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. That's, this one's fine. Yeah, um, you need to say about okay, this. Okay, well, the you thing was, doing. so what we did was um, we had an 18 month conservation project. We uh -huh. had a papyrus conservation specialist who did the actual conservation. We did a lot of the technical examination, but she did the taking it apart mm -hmm. um, with all these hot, 
because the trouble with all these little horrible sort of joins that were on the back um, meant were, were, were sort of slightly fighting with the papyrus. It was all coppled right. and skewed. And so what we had to do was um, relax it, uh, relax the, the, the structure of the papyrus in uh, humidity chambers, remove all those from the back, and then we redo them with actually tabs or little tiny tabs of um, a more synthetic material, which is called Japanese. Japanese so this is, this is sort of stuck to the, so the board still, then, on, but with that material? On the back. Uh, can you see, oh, this one doesn't seem to, they seem to be complete pieces, but you can see the tiny, yeah, the tiny tabs that are holding this down are actually, in fact, you can't see them because they're so small in other, where they're actually joining pieces of the papyrus. So all the fragments are joined with those tiny, wow. tiny little tabs. Now, the problem with that was that, of course, we realised that we've, we've put it, we've got enough to make these big sections and the best way to protect the papyrus is to keep it actually between sheets of glass. Mm -hmm. But you can't have a two, a, you know, a two <laughs> meter length of glass safely. Yeah. So, and what we didn't want to do was to sort of impo impose false breaks. Yeah. So if we'd wanted to break this up here, we would have had to have separated the papyrus up, but we wouldn't have had this nice long run. So we thought, well, what can we do? And what we decided we would, what we thought we could do, and we talked to our friends in the Department of Engineering next door, uh -huh. was make what you're seeing here. So the different sections, if we just slide them apart in the sections. But it means that because it's been cut like this, it accommodates where we have got gaps. Um, and uh, we spent many hours, didn't we? <laughs> drawing, <laughs> yeah. drawing, onto, drawing onto the glass, not and, and then in fact um, having to translate that um, into something that could be read by the machine um, in engineering yeah. and it was a, a, a water cutting machine that cut the glass sheets um, and then the whole thing's put together um, and so when we have it like this we can actually slide the sections Good. together and see it um, complete. Amazing stuff. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much. I mean, this really is very special. So, if you're free on Saturday, then you, you do need to make sure you uh, get down to the, the Fit Fit William uh, Museum so that you can uh, see this. Um, is there anything else they need to know about Saturday in order to um, make sure they, they get in? It's, it's usual museum hours, isn't it? It is. is. Um, what we're going to do is actually bring people into the next door gallery, first of all, where there'll be a very short presentation of a bit about what we've been talking about. But also allow people's eyes to adjust fit to darker lighting. And then they'll come through into here and have a chance to look at this um, and, and stay in. We'll be here to ask questions. Yep. We've got volunteers who'll be here as well. So, you know, please do come. So there you go. Come along on Saturday. Um, the only other thing I'd like you to do is to make sure that you follow the Cambridge uh, University Museum's Facebook page as that we're doing. And do remember to like and share this too so that lots of people can see this video. Um, but that's all for us. Uh, thank you so much to, to both of you. This has been uh, absolutely fascinating. And we'll see you again soon.